tenderest are more inclined to working with women children people with spinal cord injury and people suffering with other life threatening and life limiting conditions welcome anisha on smoke handing over to you uh thank you so much miss preeti and mrs sangeet uh, is my audio clear yes, yes. all right thanks uh so good afternoon all of you uh, i'm really glad to be uh in the session today and i'm really happy to be a part of the team uh so today without much introduction i think uh, we'll just start the session uh, give me a moment to share my okay all right you're sharing yeah, yeah. all right yeah uh, so today we will be talking about a couple of topics uh, that is communicating bad news and uh, managing collusion and also if time permits i'd also like to talk to you about um, how to deal with emotions and especially uh, anger next slide please so um, the question that i have i i have uh, to put forward to you is why do we need to discuss about uh, communicating bad news why is this is so important why do we have to understand about the process of communicating bad news um so basically bad news is anything uh, other than pleasant news like the word says uh, for example if a patient has to be knowing about the diagnosis or the prognosis that is definitely a bad news to the patient and family and um, communicating it in a specific manner in a way which is not hurtful to them and in a way which is skillful is very important otherwise um, it will lead to a lot of emotional distress in them and eventually which might be very detrimental to their emotional well-being next slide um so basically there are two models which uh, which are and were used for communicating bad news the first one is full disclosure model and the second one is non disclosure model like the words literally mean full disclosure model is the one in which the information or the bad news is completely communicated with the patient um keeping in mind that the patient has the right to know and the patient has the right to understand about the condition and all that and this model is mostly uh used by people in the west and uh, when it comes to non disclosure model it uh, it is a model in which the information does not reach the patient at all the bad news does not reach the patient and this is mostly seen in countries like india where the families have a lot of say in uh, the patient's well being so uh, if the family decides the patient not to know then uh, that information is not disclosed to the patient next slide please so uh, before stepping into uh, understanding the best model of disclosure we'll have to know two main things one is that the patient has the right to know and similarly the patient has the right not to know if the patient decides that the patient wants to know then he knows if they decide they do not want to know then they do not know. but uh, i i'd like you you guys to use the chat box uh, for your comments or questions so next is a question to all of you so what do you think is a best model of disclosure it can be the previous two models that i uh, showed in the previous slide or it can be something else that comes to your mind please use the chat box to know your answer <laughs> i think no one else wants to answer uh, where there's enough communication because we're talking about communication all right more answers are coming thank you so much i think all of you are in the right track uh, so next slide please so there is this model which uh, which is commonly used in palliative care that is individualized disclosure model like a lot of you said um, if the person wants to know i i'll just read out what is written if the person wants to know then the person should be allowed if the person does not want to know 
the person should be allowed not to know. And if the person wants to know, there's a very important question that we have to ask ourselves. How much does the per person want to know? So this model focuses on uh, tailor-made disclosure. That is, each person has different preferences and each person has different uh, ways of dealing with things. So it depends on the person, it depends on the patient, which way they need the information to be disclosed from our side. So if uh, the second sentence is very important in a way that if the patient wants to know, uh, mostly when we communicate bad news, we do not just uh, uh, sp spill out the whole information to the patient at a stretch. We make sure that we understand how much the person wants to know. Maybe, for example, I'll be talking about it in the later slides, but uh, for example, if uh, we start communicating the bad news to the patient and we tell that it seems like a tumor or uh, sort of thing, things sort of uh, like that, and then if the patient does not show, if the non-verbal cues suggest that the patient does not know, want to know more, or if the patient says to you directly that I do not want to know anymore, then uh, we being professionals are to listen to them and uh, to make sure that the information is not disclosed to them to an extent where they do not want to know. Next slide, please. Yes. Um, so who should communicate the bad news? So basically, um, anybody, anybody from the multidisciplinary team who has a good rapper with the patient is the one who is most preferable to be communicating the bad news. And at the same time, that person should be trustworthy to the, uh, to the uh, patient. Uh, they should have enough information and knowledge about the medical condition of the patient. And they also need to have the right amount of communication skills, be it verbal communication skills, be it non-verbal communication skills. They need to have all the patient. If it is not just one of these factors that come into play, it is all of these factors together which makes the communication better. Next slide, please. Yes. So why do we have to communicate bad news? Uh, so a couple of reasons are mentioned here. The first one would be uh, most of the patients, if uh, they get to know, for example, if uh, a patient suffers with uh, CA pancreas and uh, we discussed, they, they already know about the diagnosis. And uh, if the prognosis is not uh, described to them or if the prognosis is not disclosed to them, uh, and if we do not communicate the bad news with them, they will not be able to plan their life ahead. Uh, if they have just a couple more months to live, if the if the prognostication comes out in a way that it is just three to six months uh, forward or something, uh, if the bad news is communicated to them, they can prepare themselves well uh, if they get to know this news. So finishing the unfinished businesses is one of the most important reasons why we communicate bad news. And planning the treatment is another reason. Uh, so sometimes uh, if the news is not communicated, if the bad news is not communicated uh, to the patient or the family, they live in a world uh, where they have a lot of expectations and uh, they think they will eventually think that things are going to be all right and they will not come into realistic terms. And this can affect their life and uh, things that happen, the things that are, happen, are, are to happen in the future very badly. So planning the treatment is also one of the reasons and uh, of course closure. Next slide, please. Yes. So how do we communicate the bad news? Uh, so I think all of you might already be aware of the spikes model. Uh, so this is the model which is normally used to communicate the bad news. Uh, the details of this will be taught in the next slides, but uh, to, to just give a brief about it, S would be the setting. So we need to choose a private, comfortable, and non-threatening setting before we disclose any bad news to a patient or a family. Make sure that the atmosphere is comfortable for them and uh, set, the, set the interview in that mode. And then comes the perception. Uncover what patient and family thinks is happening. We need to understand the patient's and family's perception of um, what their condition is and what they're currently going through. The next step would be invitation. So after we set the interview, 
and we understand the perception of the family, we invite them. We ask the patient what they would like to know. And following this, we uh, express, we disclose our knowledge about the condition and the care, care options in a language which is understandable to the patient and avoiding jargons. And uh, this is a major stage in which we have to be very careful when we are disclosing the news, when we are giving information. It has to be given in a step-by-step -step manner um, and it has to be given with enough caution. And then comes the emotions. Uh, so once we disclose the news to the patient or the family, then there will be a lot of emotions that come out. Uh, it can be, uh, they might start crying, they might become angry. Uh, sometimes people don't, uh, people sit emotionless also. That is also another scenario. So what we have to do in those cases is respect their feelings and respond with empathy. And the next phase uh, in this spikes model is summarize. So uh, we need to recap and uh, sort of, if, if possible, if the patient or the family can paraphrase it for us, or if they can re uh, retell the whole uh, thing that they have understood about what we discussed, that would be the best way of doing it. So, uh, and by this, we can understand if the patient has completely understood what we communicate. Sometimes what happens is, uh, we disclose the whole thing to them. We communicate the bad news in a really good fashion. And then um, when we ask the patient what they've understood, they, they might still be stuck at a point where they got the news. And the things after that, after that might not have been heard by them because it was all a very different phase for them. It was all a very, very huge news for them. And it might not have been digested by them already by the time we reach the last phase. So the summarizing part is also very important. Next slide, please. So, uh, like like we prepare, like a surgeon uh, prepares a patient for surgery, pre pre procedure preparation, uh, like a professional pre prepares themselves before any procedure. We need to prepare ourselves before the uh, process of communicating bad news. So, uh, first and foremost, we need to update ourselves on the patient's medical condition, be it. Uh, be it whoever who's communicating the bad news with the patient. We need to update ourselves on the patient's medical condition. We need to have a clear idea of the diagnosis, the prognosis, the current uh, treatments that are going on, the uh, all the therapies that are under, undergone by the patient and all that. And then we need to have a clear picture of their emotional status at, as well. So I think you might have already uh, gone through the section of total pain and all that. So there are different quadrants and different aspects which contribute to the pain, like physical, emotional, uh, psychological, spiritual and all that. So, so it is important to have a clear picture of the emotional status of the patient and the family. Uh, if we have to be uh, communicating the bad news effectively. And allocate a dedicated time slot for the process, preferably a time with no disturbances. Um, so this is the first step in uh, the whole process of communicating bad news in the Spikes model, that is setting up the interview. So uh, that when we are setting up a session with a patient to communicate the bad news, we need to make sure that it is a time which is comfortable for both the patient and family and for us, the health professional who is communicating. Um, and it is preferred to be a time when there is very less disturbance. Proper, It can be in the evening post work or sometime during the mid mornings where um, the disturbance is quite less and it depends on your setting. And then uh, set the environment. Uh, make sure that the place is comfortable for the patient as well. And this can even include a simple uh, simple act of keeping ready some tissues or keeping the chairs in a position where uh, there can be a good amount of proximity between the therapist, between the professional and the patient. All these tiny things also matter. And uh, then the next thing is be prepared to act. Listen. Make sure that you have your eyes and ears all for the patient uh, when we are communicating the bad news to the patient. Next slide, please. Yes. Uh, now starting the interviews. Uh, interview. So uh, the next 
point comes the perception spikes model p uh, understand the patients and families insight about the illness um uh, talk to them clearly about uh, what they know about the current condition and how the treatment process is going on and ask them to speak about their concerns um and uh, explore if the patient actually wants to know and uh, sometimes the patient can directly tell you like i i really don't want to know i think i can hand it over to my uh, sons and daughters they can take care of it uh, but in cases where the patient actually wants to know if you understand the patient really wants to know then uh, start with a warning shot next slide please so a warning shot is something which is given right before a huge news is um, explained to someone or uh, the bad news is actually broken to the patient uh, it can go like this if it is something serious would you still want to know these can be the questions this is one of the uh, modes in which a warning shot can be given um, next slide please and a uh, post warning shot notice the change in the atmosphere in the room uh, so by the time we tell the patient that that sentence like if it is something serious would you like to know uh, the patient gets an idea of uh, the thing that this is something serious and uh, then we'll have to understand the change in the atmosphere and if the patient wants to know if from their non verbal cues and from their if they tell you that they want to know use a narrative approach next slide please um, so basically it's like narrating a story um narrate the story of the patient just I, i would like you all to imagine a situation where a patient is right in front of you and uh, you are trying to explain you're trying to communicate this bad news to the patient so when the patient is right in front of you and you have a really good rapport with the patient and you have the skills and knowledge uh to deliver the bad news and the patient trusts you then slowly narrate the story of the patient but narrate it in a way that it is crisp and clear and it has the content of what you would like to share with the patient so narrate the story of the patient to the patient from the beginning in a crisp way and give small chunks of information about what you want to address and slowly escalate the information and uh, this is also very important pause whenever required give the patient enough time to digest the information next slide please so uh, a typical example for this like i mentioned before is that um when uh, we discuss if we tell to a patient the whole story of how they reach this stage and then go on like the x ray showed something like a shadow the shadow turned out to be a tumor and uh, then at the same time give pauses and slowly escalate so the speed of the interview is decided by the patient and not anyone not you not the interviewer not the communicator it is decided by the patient look at the patient's eyes make sure that they keep eye contact with you and if at all the eye, con eye contact is lost um, don't proceed to the next sentence it is better to pause there and give them some space and time and uh, do not proceed if the patient does not want to know more but if we get the idea that the patient wants to know more if the patient is giving you good eye contact if the patient is eager to know if the patient asks you can you just tell can you just give the information to me then you proceed to the next stage on further investigation to me appear to be a cancer and then the conversation uh, goes on like that next slide please finishing the interview um so the patient either gets the full information or had enough for the time being so the one scenario in which the patient gets the full information the process is sort of complete whereas the other scenario in which the patient says uh i think this is enough for me i i do not want to know any more that is a situation where the information is enough for the patient at that point in time but we might have to have more sessions to discuss about the rest of the things or to discuss about the patient's feelings and how they would like to move forward and then be prepared for an emotional reaction or a lack of it to the bad news 
um i love the emotional reaction uh, can you go to the previous Yes, allow the emotional reaction uh, to run its course. It can be the patient can get emotional in a way that they start crying really badly, uh, or it can be in a way that they yell at you or they yell at the hospital that you're working at. So uh, be prepared. The person who is handling, who is managing uh, the session, needs to be capable enough to allow all the emotional reactions. Next slide. So um, one thing we have to be very careful is that when the patient is ventilating the emotions, uh, it is very important that we be present with them. We, and we do not say or do anything. We make sure that our presence is felt by the patient and that we are with the patient. Next slide, please. So uh, once the emotional reaction subsides, Ask if the patient wants any more information. And uh, usually in this case, the patient would want to know more about the curability, treatment options, the costs involved, and the future plans. And in this stage, uh, the thing that we have to keep in mind is that we have to be very honest, uh, clear, and give precise answers. And if at all you do not know uh, the right answer to the question that the patient has asked you, uh, tell them tell them honestly that uh, I might not be the right person or I, I might not have the uh, right amount of information right now. Uh, would it be okay if I get back to you? So uh, be, be clear, be honest and give precise answers to the patients. Next slide, please. And uh, make sure that you do not give false hopes. Do not, uh, do not give false hopes at all. Do not give achievable hopes. Give them clear follow-up plans. Ask for any doubts or clarifications. Uh, so basically what all these points are telling is that once you communicate the bad news, that's not just the end of it. Uh, you need to make sure that all these things are taken care of. Ask for any doubts or clarification that the patient or family may still have. And close the interview by leaving the door open. That is, uh, make sure that you have kept the conversation open for the patient and uh, give them an opportunity to reach back if they would like to discuss about things or if they have any concerns to talk about. Next slide, please. And post-procedure follow-up. Um, visit or call the patient within one day's time to know how the patient and family has been coping with the new development. So all of a sudden, this uh, information has been given to the patient and family and uh, trust me that is going to change their lives like it can affect their lives a lot so we need to make sure that we visit or call the patient within a day's time to understand how they are dealing with the information that we've given to them and uh, the patient and family may need further clarifications or more information in the coming days next slide please okay i can go back to the previous slide uh, so I'm just giving a pause right here. I know that you guys might be bored already. Uh, there, there was a lot of information. So uh, I can give this, give this time for questions. If anybody has any questions or if you have any comments on what we discussed right now, you can unmute your mics and please speak. Shiva Kumar has written, I had to face a miserable situation. I broke the bad news and one of the family members attempted suicide. Uh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, yes, sometimes. Uh, so that is the reason why in the post-procedure follow-up, it is mentioned that we need to make sure that we keep them in the loop uh, after a couple of hours after discussing the uh, bad news or um, after the patient gets to know the bad news, we need to make sure that the follow-up is very crisp and clear because uh, 
it 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 would be a really tough ride for them uh knowing that there is no cure or knowing that um there is no hope anymore uh it wouldn't be easy for them so understanding their emotions and uh giving them the right right giving them the right ways to cope with it is very important and uh, how do we manage in such a situation all through the treatment the family member was cooperative so basically as per my understanding and uh, with the knowledge that i have i think if such a situation comes uh, we need to be very careful and we need to be um, we need to look out for signs of suicidal ideations or um signs of so uh, signs of suicidal thoughts in the patient so give me a moment sorry yes so if we identify that there has been any signs of uh, serious signs of illnesses serious signs of suicide then we need to make sure that the responsible um, healthcare professionals give an intimation about uh, the patient's issue um but the thought of the loss of a family member caused depression yes looking out for the signs of uh, mental health issues is very important and like i said the post procedure follow up is also very important um and uh, sometimes these inconveniences happen these situations happen and uh, sometimes it's out of our control but what we can do is do our best to make sure that uh, we have done everything from our side to take care of the patient and family so what is a rough estimate of time during the session when we say give them time for emotion or cry um i think that also depends on um uh, that also depends on the situation that you are facing like it can differ from it can differ from patients to patients um i say i would say uh, yeah i think not be a gap that it it just ruins the session uh it should be a gap where the patient has uh, enough space to think about situations process about situations and at the same time the uh, session should move on uh and that is where the play of non verbal communication matters a lot um uh, it is not, not just through words or through just the silences that if we do not uh, look into the non verbal cues put forward by the patient we might not be able to understand how much time we have to give so um i think it is individualized and we need to look for signs uh, like eye contact um or the patient might fidget uh, if they have something in mind uh, yeah look for all those signs and i i'm sure you will be able to manage it i hope uh, i have addressed questions yeah one more thing yes please go on if you want to unmute and uh, ask you can please um i think by the time uh, sr shiva kumar asked the question we might we can go to the uh, next slide yes the question is now uh, the patient's family hates us when we don't cry with them um i i would say that that might be an assumption uh because uh okay they call us inhuman have you have you personally faced any experiences where they have uh, done so all right okay um i i that is so unfortunate that what has happened uh, in my practice what i understand is that uh, see it is not wrong for us to shed some drops of tears if that family was very close to you but uh, some people say some people might disagree with this uh, it, it is very important being a healthcare professional that we have controlled emotional involvement with the patients and families but in certain situations it is okay if we uh like like i said if you shed a few drops of tears that is okay but don't take it to a situation where you sit and cry with the patient and make them feel more distressed and that is not not at all a professional way of doing it but um i think if you're like we look into the patients and families non verbal non verbal cues the patients and families uh, also look at our non verbal cues 
So if we give the right nonverbal cues, if if we communicate, if I communicate the bad news with all the steps that I I had discussed before, if I follow all that steps, but at the same time, I keep a rude face or I keep a face without any emotions that might uh, give a wrong impression to the family or the patients thinking that we are not involved in their care. So our nonverbal cues are also very important is what um, I would say in these cases. So if we take care of that, I think most of the problems can be sorted. Um, I hope that helps. So I think we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, so now we'll be talking about collusion. So um, collusion is the shielding of information from one person. And in palliative care, the information is mostly shielded from the uh, patient. And that is mostly done by the family. So in a case where the family collutes the information from the patient, uh, a couple of things that we need to do, being a social worker or a psychologist or a, a physiotherapist or a, whoever, whoever it might be, uh, who's disclosing the information to the family. Um, I think it is better that it is just very important that we acknowledge the family's fear. So uh, basically, the family might be colluding the information. Uh, they might be fearful that the patient might harm harm themselves uh, if the information is disclosed to them, or they might be thinking that it might uh, worsen their situation, uh, it might cause anxiety in them if the information is shared with them. So uh, what we can do is acknowledge the family's fears, uh, make sure that we understand that uh, their fear is valid and uh, they know the patient better than we know them. And do not ever challenge the family's belief. Uh, so I have, I've had a patient uh, uh, whose... Uh, son was a primary caregiver, younger son was a primary caregiver and there were no other family members involved in the care. And uh, this man, he was a 30-year-old uh, man. He did not want his mother to know about her condition. Um, and uh, his belief was that if, if my mother gets to know this condition, she has lived for the last 13 years without knowing her diagnosis. So if she gets to know about her conditioner, condition right now, I think it will break her and it will cause a lot of anxiety to her and she will not be able to deal with it. So uh, in that situation, what we can do is uh, we, we have to just acknowledge uh, that their fear is valid and never go to challenge the family's belief. And make sure that you agree to collude. And I this is my suggestion. I would suggest to uh, make sure that we agree to collude and maintain that. Uh, so this will eventually calm them down and then um, through this, we we can win the trust of the family member and we can have a strong rapport with them, much more stronger rapport with them. And uh, then what you can do is slowly work with the family. So this shouldn't be, so there shouldn't be a fixed agenda before us uh, to just communicate the bad news or just break the pollution. So what we have to do is work with the family, build a relationship with the family, uh, cater their emotional needs and listen to them if uh, to whatever they have to say to us next slide please and uh, then what we can do is uh, we have to let the family know orient the family about the benefits of communicating the bad news with the patient uh, we had discussed this in the previous uh, slide that is uh, it can help them in planning their future it can give them a closure um, it can help them in uh, finishing their unfinished businesses and all that. So we need to explain all these facts. A family member might not think about all of this. They would just want to be protective. So uh, we are the ones who have to orient the family about the benefits of communicating the bad news with the patient. And uh, be, be vigilant not to push their agenda. Have enough patience. Continue working with the family and be prepared for failures and continue to do the best you can for the patient. So there might be multiple attempts and then the family still wouldn't want uh, to communicate the bad news, but just keep reminding them about the benefits of communicating. And this also uh, should be uh, depending on each patient's situations. 
depend uh, look at the pros and cons of communicating the bad news and if the benefit versus burden i would say so uh, and depending on that we have to worry in the family about uh, the benefits and uh, think wisely and uh, work with the family uh, for the betterment of the patient next slide please um next is dealing with emotions uh so we have one more question in the chat um one more comment it's difficult to build a relationship with the family especially in rural areas they trust the... okay all right um yes uh, unfortunately um in in the rural parts of our country it might be very difficult uh, to deal with the situations but um there is no other option than keeping on trying and creating more awareness about all these things uh i think one more option that we can uh, use is um identifying people who the uh, who the uh, community people in the community who they're close with and involving uh, them in the conversations uh, if at all uh, the family and the person who's involved in the community is okay with it so uh, making making bridges to uh, um, to make the communication stronger would be helpful is what i feel yes now coming to dealing with emotions next slide please so here we are talking about anger uh, the other emotions we had spoken about before um so if at all while communicating the bad news the patient starts crying uh, really badly then what we can do is we can sit with them make sure that uh, our presence is felt by them uh, to and also show them through the non verbal uh, cues that we are with them and uh, some tiny tiny uh, things that we think are unimportant like uh, handing over them a uh, tissue box or just um, touching their hand or uh, Uh, making your presence felt is very important in case the patient uh, or the family starts crying and uh, then the processes can be followed like we discussed earlier but what if someone gets angry so uh, first of all we need to understand the reason why patients or families become angry uh, in cases where the uh, bad news is broken um, i have i have felt that uh, this is mostly seen in uh, situations in settings like uh, hospital or um, it is mostly seen in hospitals and it is very difficult uh, to, to see these situations in uh, purely palliative care endios as per my uh, understanding uh, and this in this situation you become you being a healthcare professional become the face of the hospital the family who is talking to you the patient who is talking to you will never just consider you as a person who's trying to help them they will see you as the face of the hospital and if there are any inconveniences that happen to them from the hospital side that is the time when they would take it out uh, they would uh, supposedly take it out um, and they they take it out on you the only reason is because you are the only person who's sitting with them mostly in hospitals uh people don't have enough time to sit with the patients listen to them or understand their feelings and address their emotional issues so if and when they get a person who is doing that they just take it out on you and especially when you are communicating a bad news that uh that comes straight on to the face so in these situations what you can do is just facilitate the anger to flow away and if at all it's just an episode of anger uh, and they just want to let it out vent it out and finish it off it just goes away like that but if you feel that things are going out of your hand uh, then uh, after a point it is better that you slowly stand uh, but at the same time you listen these are just a couple of strategies which can be used uh, you stand and then listen to the patient and uh, at the same time you can uh, you can lean forward a little bit and make sure that the other person feels that you are listening to them and also maintain uh, eye contact with the patient with the person who is angry and uh, give a confident eye contact because uh, at the uh, at the end of the day it is safety also that matters 
uh, and slowly try to resolve the situation by uh, dealing with it and if the uh, if the person who is opposite to you tries to understand if the person is on if, if the person is trying to be on the same page as you then slowly sit down and discuss about the situation and um, also if they have any misconceptions or if you have something to correct them from their misconceptions it would be a right situation to slowly like not at this initial stage when they have calmed down it would be uh, really good if you correct any correctables that have happened in the conversation and that uh, what have what has made the patient angry so uh, this is a, this is the thing that we'll have to do when someone's angry uh, and I, I i can recall a situation where my professor has told me um, in uh, settings of counseling if at all uh, there is a situation where you can be in the side of the door like and the patient or the uh, client can be opposite to you uh, that would be the right way to do it um, because this ensures enough safety for you like if at all some situation happens where there is a lot of violence or anger you can uh, move yourself out of the situation uh, easily so that is just one thing that i'd like to add and um, if at all there is a situation where there are a couple of people or uh, or many people in the family who uh, who are angry at you in the same room with you and you are the only person there um, i would suggest that uh, you better give a give an alert uh, to the authorities or uh, make sure that uh, you let your colleagues know about it or uh, try to move away from the situation and uh, address it in a way which is uh, legally and uh, ethically or ethically right so i think this is the end of the presentation um so just to give you a recap i'll just take the slide so uh, what we've discussed today is about communicating bad news uh, and the topics we talked about in communicating bad news is the models of disclosure uh, the full disclosure model and the non-disclosure model and the most important um, and the most uh, better one, I ideal one being individualized disclosure model, the one in which uh, the disclosure is done based on each patient's, uh, each patient's requirements. And if the patient wants to know, we need to understand how much the patient wants to know and the skills required um, and the person who has to communicate the bad news should be trustworthy, should have the good amount of information and should have the right amount of skills. And why do we communicate bad news? Uh, and the model to communicate bad news, that is Spike's model. And uh, giving the warning shot, that is the, short, uh, the statement before you give out the whole news and uh, how to be giving out uh, bad news. Uh, it should be in the form of narrating a story. And uh, we should make sure that when the patient is ventilating, uh, we do not say or do anything, but we have to be with the patient. Um, and post the procedure, post the communication, we need to make sure that adequate uh, follow-up is maintained. We need to make sure that uh, the family feels that we are with them and uh, the patient feels that we are with them, uh, whatever comes in the way. Then we spoke about collusion, shielding of information from someone, and it is mostly the patient who shielded the information from. And um, uh, in these cases, we need to acknowledge the family's fears and work with the family orient them about the benefits of communicating the bad news and then take decisions appropriately. Then finally, we spoke about dealing with uh, emotions and especially anger and what to do in situations where the um, receiver is angry or receiver is dealing their uh, emotions in, in the state of anger. Uh, so that would be the end of my presentation. I think uh, I'll just hand over this session to uh, Sangeet and Preeti.
I'm sure there's a doubt in the uh, chat box by Jayant Kosh, Kosh that you ca can you explain the collusion tenants once more? Okay. Um, I, I really do not understand the meaning of tenants. Let me yeah. just look it up. <laughs> what does that mean? Jayanda, can you oh, if you can unmute open and up and uh, unmute and ask the question yourself? Okay. Uh, yeah, ma'am, I was just asking whether you can please once again explain the uh, uh, the ways to which we go in the collusion, how to go about it. Okay, um, yeah, I, I would go to that slide. Uh, and thank you so much, Jayant. Um, Yes. Uh, so basically, collusion is, uh, like, like we discussed earlier, collusion is the shielding of information from uh, one person. And mostly in palliative care situations, it becomes the patient who is being polluted the information from. Uh, and the family would be the one who hides the information uh, from the patient for many reasons. It can be uh, thinking that the patient would become anxious if the bad news is broken to them. Or it can be a fact that the patient's condition might deteriorate if we discuss uh, the bad news with the patient. So in these cases, we need to make sure that the family is handled really well. Um, what we have to do is we need to acknowledge, acknowledge the family's fear, understand why the family is not wanting to uh, let the patient know about this issue. And uh, in these cases, do not challenge the family's beliefs. Uh, the family knows the patient much better than us. And if at all we break the uh, collusion against the family's wishes, it can cause a lot of, uh, lot of uh, issues in the rapport we have with the patient and family. So uh, agree to collude and maintain, uh, ag agree for the collusion to the patient. And uh, this will help calm them. This will help win the trust of the family. And the major reason why we are doing this is because once the family and we are on the same page, it will be very easy to work with the patient. Uh, so this will help win the trust of the family and work with the family, build a relationship with the family, cater their emotional needs, listen to them. Uh, next slide, please. So the aim of all this is to make the family slowly understand about the benefits of communicating the bad news. So why do we communicate bad news? Uh, initial slides, we discussed that it is important uh, for people to know the bad news because uh, they can finish their unfinished businesses, they can have a closure, they can, uh, they can look forward to things that they would want to do and they can take decisions uh, which would have to be taken before they leave. So um, orienting the family about the benefits of communicating the bad news is important. Most often uh, what is seen is once we discuss uh, the benefits of communicating the bad news, uh, families try to understand that, yes, this is something that would be better done than kept aside. So slowly they uh, they also support us in breaking. Sometimes the family themselves take the step to break the collusion. They, they tell us that, yes, uh, I can do this by myself. I think I'll give it a try. And if at all uh, they are not able to do it, they ask us for help and then we can be the ones doing it. And if we are the ones doing it, do not, um, if we are the ones managing the whole situation, do not push the agenda of making uh, the family agree to the fact that the news has to be broken to the patient. So have good amount of patience. Sometimes this does not work. And uh, in these situations, we have to continuously uh, continue to work with the family and continue to, the, continue to do the best you can for the patient. I hope uh, this makes it clear. Yeah, thank you so much, ma'am. No issues, thank you. I'm sure there is one more uh, question. What is the meaning of kyphosis? Yeah, I, th I think that is addressed. 
I think the concept is clear. Someone has unmuted and asked. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, I have a doubt that yes. what if we are got in a situation where, as you said, for collusion, the family members are, you know, uh, being a little bit uh, not able to communicate with the uh, patient, but the patient somehow senses that, okay, something is wrong with me. I need a closure. So it could be better if you tell me what the diagnosis is, I could get ready for it. But at that time, if the family is not insisting on it, what could we do? We should prioritize mm -hmm. the patient's feelings or talk to the family because it could feel, I feel like if we push the, as you said, that if we push the family who are not ready to communicate with the patient, how could this, how can we manage with the conversation, ma'am, here? Um, thank you so much for asking the question. That is a very relevant question. So in these situations, even I have faced these situations and uh, what I do in this situation is that if the patient uh, is very clear that they would like to know about the condition or if they would like to know about the prognosis or diagnosis uh, and if they have expressed that to me being a social worker I would definitely discuss this issue with the family first of all I will tell the patient that uh, I will get back to you right now uh, I'm not in a position to talk about it so I will discuss that issue with the team that I'm involved in um, and then I will definitely discuss with the family and make them understand that uh, the patient wants to know about it. And I, I would definitely work with the family and make sure that the patient gets the information. And even in this situation, we have to make sure that the protocol of uh, communicating the bad news is looked into. Because sometimes even when the patient is asked you, like, I want to know about this, um, they might not want to know the full information. So follow the steps and make sure discuss with the family make sure that they understand the importance of it with the family to an extent where the information is enough for the patient i hope that is clear yes ma'am thank you thank you Yeah, I think uh, Anam, was, Anam has also asked the same question. Uh, yeah, definitely the patient has the right to know. Uh, in an ideal situation, we have to just look into what the patient wants and give them the information. But uh, keeping the cultural context into, uh, keeping it as a factor, um, I think the family's involvement is also important. But we need to make sure that the patient patient's rights are uh, respected. Um, so to which family member do you communicate? How to decide that? So um, I would prefer, uh, in my initial, uh, day, initial uh, year of practice, I had not thought about this in detail or I, I have not had a clarity to this but then as years pass by I got to understand that uh, we first of all when we meet a patient and family in the initial assessment it would be better uh, to understand who the primary caregiver is and who the decision maker is so um, I would say that the primary primary caregiver would be the one who is always with the patient does everything uh, for the patient for example uh, if there's a spinal cord injury patient uh, who recently met with an accident and uh, the patient has his wife who would be the primary caregiver and who has been the uh, uh, who's been the all in all of the family but then she does not know to take decisions by I mean like she's not been involved in taking the decisions by herself she always depended on uh, the husband's brother uh, so in these situations uh, what would be preferable is to involve the involve both the primary caregiver and the decision maker in all the conversations uh, in the maximum number of conversations that are possible with them uh, i think that is how the communication can be maintained without a gap i hope that is clear skita Um, I am not able to look into the chat box. My system has gone into a freeze mode. So 
uh, if Preeti, Ms. Preeti can help me. Uh, Manisha, there's no more questions in the chat box. If anyone has any anything to ask, any doubts, feel free, unmute yourself and you can ask. The chat box, there's nothing, Manisha. Ma'am. All right. Uh, I, I can see your comment from. Yeah, please go on. Please go on. Ma'am, so this is not a question exactly. So, this is kind of a confirmation mm -hmm. which I need uh, in the class what you have taught us. So, the thing is that if right. a family member is uh, telling us, like, mm -hmm. okay, you don't need to tell the bad news to them uh, because it could worsen his issue and we could literally see the patient getting better without knowing the diagnosis, it is okay to go along with it. That is what you had told us, ma'am. Um, I, I didn't understand the question. Would you be able to repeat the question, please? Yes, ma'am, sure. So if the family members uh, are telling us no need, no need to tell the uh, bad news to the or the diagnosis to the patient, we just told it's just a some kind of, if it is a cancer, they just say it's just a small lump in your stomach. If it is an esophageal mm -hmm. or something cancer and they are in stage three and they are getting some other chemotherapy as well, other treatments, mm -hmm. radiotherapy. So if the patients are getting better, we could literally see that. Is it okay to go along with the, what the family is saying without revealing the diagnosis to the patient? See, like I mentioned before, thank you for the question. So, like I mentioned before, if the family, if the patient has not asked you to reveal the information, if the patient do not, does not have a question of what is wrong with me or if the patient does not ask you directly like what my issue is, then we do not have to, they have the right not to know. So, we do not have to let them know uh, unless they ask. And if the family wishes uh, the same, then it is good to go. Uh, but then eventually you can have conversations with the patient in a way that can direct, uh, that can help them in their betterment. Like if, uh, but that doesn't need uh, a communication of bad news if they do not ask. Okay, ma'am. Because sometimes when we approach the patient, so the family members comes like, you know, uh, they come suddenly, their safeguard mode gets on and they come and they, they don't know the diagnosis. Please don't tell them. I just told them it's just a small stone. That's all you'll get eventually soon. Yes, yes, yes. Um, if, 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 but yeah, in that case, if the family has not, if the patient has not asked you, then it is good to go. Uh, but if the patient asks you at some at some point, then you will have to discuss with the family and then. But uh, I think it is important to inform the family about the importance of discussing of communicating the bad news with the patient. And it is their call to take if at all they want to tell it or uh, they do not want to tell it and they want to continue with the same process. Okay, ma'am. Thank you for the clarity. Thank you. One more, one more issue that Shivagumar Vishwanathan has put into the chat. Uh, uh, Ma'am, I had to face a very embracing situation once. My team, uh, and I, team and I gently broke the bad news to the patient family about the end of life, but the patient survived and the entire village had uh, bad mouth us for giving the wrong information. We lost the trust. We just ran for our lives. What would you have the, done in such a situation? Yes, uh, I was just reading through that uh, comment. So uh, I've heard, I've not personally dealt with this situation, but I've heard people going through the situation. So uh, sometimes it, it is very unfortunate to go through that. Uh, but if if you if there is an expert team uh, which went through the situation and if they prognosticated and if they were so sure that uh, the prognosis is in a particular way, um, I think it is okay that you have communicated. But uh, the communication should be in a way that um, you uh, yeah I I've, I've actually seen a, a professional. <laughs> communicating in a way uh, she, when she always communicates she always gives a heads up that uh, see this is the uh, general trend in the population studies uh, we have seen that people suffering with so and so issues uh, 
and when considering your uh, father's or mother's illness and all the assessment criteria we we have figured that this is the uh, a number of months or years that uh, she would be living for or so and so you can you can just give the information but also give them uh, an idea that there are outliers see in every every cases there might be outliers uh, people might uh, pass away before that and uh, people might pass away after that or they might live longer so uh, i think giving uh, giving them the actual reality that this is the general uh, this is based on the general population study and uh, there are outliers and giving them the realistic picture of how things could be we shouldn't uh, communicate in a way that in prognostication that is uh, the most important thing like we shouldn't give them an idea that this is how it is going to be uh, we need to make them understand the both the side the middle part and both the sides of the situation yes um, there is one more yes. comment that has come oh yeah uh, that just came I'm really sorry I did not uh, I had seen the question but I was not able to get back the question that's why I couldn't address it in the beginning. Sorry about that. Shomar, I hope your doubt has been cleared. Any more? Anybody else have any more doubts to ask? Ma'am, uh, I have a doubt. Yes, please go on. Um, Ma'am, have you come across um, uh, families where no uh, mm -hmm. two children don't agree on whether the news should be passed on to their parents uh, regarding the uh, uh, health issue. The children are uh, not in the uh, same position. One is saying that you can, uh, the other is saying no. The children don't come to a uh, conclusion regarding whether this has to be broken to the, the news has to be broken to the parents. I mean, if it's a mother or the father who is having the terminal illness. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I have not come across the situation. If if I can recall it right, I have not come across the situation exactly. Okay. Okay. Uh, but uh, I, I still can't recall. So in those that those situations would be really difficult to deal with when there is conflict in the family. Yeah. And uh, the first thing that has to be addressed is the conflict between the siblings. So that yeah, would because, require a good amount of professional help. Yes. Ah, yeah. Because when you were saying, also you were saying uh, bridging. That is, you can bring other people inside. I don't think in this uh, world uh, you can, uh, especially in a town like Trivandrum, it is very difficult to get uh, people to bridge. Uh, you know, um, especially when even children are not in. Uh, when the, even the children are at loggerhead, so you can't get other people to manage like this. I have seen. Not uh, like um, breaking the news like that, but uh, children having two uh, uh, different opinions regarding even the treatment for the parents. Yes, yes, uh, that is mostly seen. Um, and and even the distant relatives can have a say in, uh, who were not at all involved in the patient's care until then can have a say when it comes to yeah. taking decisions at the end. But what we have to keep in mind is that primary decision maker and primary caregiver Sometimes the primary caregiver can be the primary decision maker also. So in those cases, only that person can be the major person who wants to be involved. And if if the patient, if that person wants someone's assistance, uh, then that can be uh, taken into consideration. But in other cases, that person can be the only person that we can communicate things with. But if there are, and maybe in this case, uh, what we can do is, if there are two different opinions from the uh, family, two different uh, children, uh, we can get the, get the input from the patient itself. The patient is in the right uh, position to communicate. Okay, uh, we can ask the patient themselves, like, why do we... That's a good uh, idea. I mean, like, whom do we think... Uh, whom do you think is the right person to talk to or talk to about your condition? Oh. And it can be based on what the patient opts. I think that'd be a better idea. Yeah, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, I I can see an interesting comment. Uh, it is best that the consulting doctor shares the news. I, I forgot to add this point in between. So uh, some people, yes, uh, some people do prefer the consulting doctor sharing the news. 
but uh, uh, according to my my practice that I've had, uh, I think the uh, activity resides on the, the the responsibility resides on the person uh, who I mentioned like has the right amount of skills, right amount of knowledge, and uh, right amount of rapport with the patient and family. But if uh, if the treating doctor or uh, if the treating physician can be a part of it, and if they take the lead, also that is completely. It just has to be a person with all those things uh, with them. It can be a treating doctor, but I would say that it is also uh, other professionals um, who who has all these things. Because I face situations where the treating doctor uh, literally had uh, issues with communicating the bad news, and they've asked for help. Like, uh, would you be able to do it? So I think uh, the hierarchies might not be a great factor in this. Uh, if the skills, trust, and uh, the knowledge is in the right place. And one more thing to add on, like if uh, if in the initial conversation, all the questions of the patients cannot uh, be addressed, if it is, um, at, if the questions are addressed to a maximum extent, and if there are like a few questions which cannot be addressed, by any other professionals, they uh, definitely have to be truthful uh, to the family and the patient and tell them that I uh, do not have an answer for this. I will definitely get in touch with someone who can answer the same for you. And then uh, the person who can answer that question or the professional who can answer that question can be handed over the session. And uh, in, so in most of the cases, what happens is uh, the doctors, the treating doctors do not have the time and the energy to spend for uh, these people to sit with them because these sessions can go long for almost an hour or so or more than that even. So uh, that is also a factor is what I understand. Any more doubt? Is there any other question? I think that would be the end of it. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Mansha, for the wonderful session. I hope everyone had an uh, informative session uh, today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Manisha. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Thank, Thank you, you. Manisha, ma'am, for the wonderful session, for clearing the, all the doubts so far. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prithi, for the presentation. Bye. Thank you. Let's see you in the next session. Bye.